Hello, my name is Richard Rabbit, and I'm pleased to present you with this presentation on Leviathan, America's Grandest Ocean Liner. This talk was originally presented in front of the Steamship Historical Society of America on February 1st, 2020. This talk talks about one of the most interesting vessels ever built, the Leviathan, and it's a series of threes that this lecture will cover. Of course, Leviathan started her career out as the Vagelan for the Hamburg America Line. She was subsequently seized in World War I and used as a troop carrier, USS Leviathan, for the United States, and then later became a successful North Atlantic passenger liner as Leviathan for United States lines. We're going to go back first a little bit just to give you context in terms of how the ship was built and where she came from. Uh, and we're going to start again with a series of threes. It's going to involve three amazing men, three countries, and three sets of ships. And we're going to go back into the 19th century by looking a little bit at where this all starts. At the end of the 19th century, Britain ruled the Earth. Britain was in control of something to 25 to 30 percent of the Earth's surface. It was an empire in which the sun never sets. And as you can see in the pink outlined areas, it was quite extensive. When you have an empire of this size, what you need to guard it, of course, is a huge navy and also an important merchant marine or a sizable merchant marine so that you can bring home goods from all the territories you control to your small island nation. At this time across the English Channel, you see in 1871 the unification of Germany, the Germanic peoples, the German-speaking peoples. What was once part of the Holy Roman Empire has risen up under Prussia as the largest area of Germanic-speaking uh, people and Germanic um, background. And you have Kaiser Wilhelm I, who is going to be installed as the king of Imperial Germany. His president minister, Otto von Bismarck, is going to be named chancellor. And indeed, he is going to be someone who rules with an iron fist on the world stage as we have a unified Germany. He'll become known as the Iron Chancellor. And what he does when uh, Germany arises into international spotlight is he sets up a series of alliances, agreements, treaties with other nations. Here we can see Germany is allied with Austria-Hungary, also with Italy. You have the Ottoman Empire over here, which has an alliance with Germany. You've got the Slav states with Bulgaria having an aid agreement with both Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. Serbia has an aid agreement with Russia, and on and on. All these alliances are set up by Otto von Bismarck, and basically they're going to be things that try to protect Germany, help to protect Germany in the time of war, or make Germany go to the aid of other countries with whom she has alliances. This will prove particularly devastating uh, in 1914 when the world slides into the Great War. Now, the first of the three amazing men is going to be Kaiser Wilhelm II. His grandfather, Kaiser Wilhelm I, as of German unification, becomes the king and the leader of a unified Germany with, as we said, the Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck as his prime minister, if you will, his chancellor. Now, in 1888, when uh, Kaiser Wilhelm I passes away. His son, reigning as Frederick III, reigns for only 99 days before he dies. He's a very ill man. And Kaiser Wilhelm I's grandson, Kaiser Wilhelm II, becomes the reigning monarch of Imperial Germany. Now, in terms of Kaiser Wilhelm II himself, he's an interesting character. He is someone that is born with a deformed arm. You'll see it's his left arm. It's always tucked behind him very carefully, or he holds a sword in it. Um, but it's something that affects him his whole life and colors his mental outlook. In terms of his personality, he's been said to be bombastic and impetuous. He makes tactless pronouncements on sensitive topics without consulting his ministers. He wants every day to be his birthday. Superficial, hasty, restless, unable to relax, without any deeper level of seriousness, work or drive, any sense of sobriety, incapable of learning from experience, and desperate for applause and success. He likes swagger, he likes, he likes tough, tough talk, and he's a man less concerned with gaining specific objectives as with asserting his will. So a very, very, very difficult personality to deal with. Someone who wants to do things on his own and not listen to those around him, not to take counsel. In 1890, he fires uh, Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, and now he is undisputed the leader of this brand new, brand new unified nation. 
It's important to remember that his grandmother is Queen Victoria in Britain. Queen Victoria and her um, husband, Prince Albert, who is German, uh, are considered um, sort of the grandparents of Europe. They have nine children, all of whom live to adulthood, and are all married into royal houses all across Europe. So all of the monarchies in Europe, especially now that Queen Victoria's children have been married off into them, are all intertwined tightly. And indeed, you can see some of this. On the left, we have Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. We have on the right, uh, Albert, who is Queen Victoria's eldest son, who will eventually reign upon her death as uh, George V. And then again, we certainly have uh, Nicholas II again and uh, King George V. They are wearing uniforms of each other's countries. And on the left, Kaiser Wilhelm II. On the right, again, Tsar Nicholas II, again, swapping uniforms. So these fellows are growing up together. They're exchanging pleasantries. They are uh, installed ceremonially as uh, members of each other's military services. And indeed, the three of them, George, Nicholas, and Wilhelm, all first cousins, will be major leaders in the push for the Great War in 1914. Another uh, individual we have to take a quick look at is Albert Ballin. Albert Ballin is a young Jewish man who's living in Hamburg. He, his father runs an emigration agency. This is an immigration, or emigration, I should say, agency that um, basically works to book passage for emigrants leaving Germany going to the New World. His father runs a very small business in Hamburg, and um, it's fairly successful, but by no means uh, anything of note other than it being steady, having a good clientele. When his father dies, Albert is, is in his early 20s, and he's been groomed to take over the business, and he does that. And he slowly builds it up, methodically, very carefully. He's a very insightful, very thoughtful young man. He is very bright, and he takes particular note of making the immigrant experience, the travel experience, as pleasant as he can, because he knows, in fact, that it's good for business and that happy uh, travelers will come back and recommend to their family and friends to use his agency when they are booking their own passage to the New World. Now, his agency is aligned with a small steamship line called the Car Line in Germany. They run uh, basically cargo steamers, and they have holds that are filled with immigrants traveling to the New World. Now, what's important to realize at this time is that immigrant transit on the North Atlantic is the bread and butter of all steamship lines. They are packing thousands of souls into the hulls of these ships, and they're shipping them off to the New World. And so it's very important that they are going forward, building new ships, packing as many people in there as possible to make as much revenue as they can for their line. And the other thing you have to remember at this time is that when you are moving immigrants to the United States, if they arrive to the United States and they have medical issues or anything that is deemed inappropriate by the American inspectors, they will be returned home on the same steamship line on which they came at the cost of the steamship line. So it was very important that these folks be deemed suitable for entry into the United States. So what Albert Ballin does, and this is a little bit later in the century when um, the Hamburg America line looks at the car line and sees what good work they're doing in terms of filling uh, spaces for immigrant travel. Uh, Hamburg America, also known as Hop Hog, buys out the car line, and with that purchase comes Albert Ballin, who goes to Hamburg America as one of their directors of North Atlantic traffic. As the century wears on, uh, Albert Ballin is concerned with building bigger and better ships to satisfy the immigrant trade. He will build his ships in Germany. He will help Hamburg America design ships for building in Germany itself. So he'll build in Germany, he'll build in the UK rather, and um, he's dedicated to providing the best experience he can for immigrants. He will be someone who lights, electrically lights passenger spaces for immigrants for the first time, and he will make all the comforts he can available to these folks traveling to the, the new world. He does, under Hamburg America, create a shoreside facility called Ballenstadt, Ballen City. And uh, in the photograph on the left, you'll see the green-tinged uh, buildings. Uh, you'll see them up on the right. These are the remaining buildings as of today. Today, it's an immigration museum uh, in Hamburg. But this was somewhere where folks transiting could get their passage booked. They could have a nice, warm, comfortable meal, and they could sleep comfortably, comfortably before embarking on their voyage. They would also be cleared by inspectors, particularly medical, before leaving for the New World. 
Now to go back a little bit more, I think, in the 19th century, to get to the point where we have to really appreciate the Vaterland and all these steamships that are going to be built, we have to take a look at the rise of technology that's come up in the ocean liner world in the 19th century. Certainly, uh, fans of ocean liners will recognize RMS Britannia, Cunard's first uh, steamship that uh, launches on July 4th, 1840, with regular service between Liverpool, Halifax, and Boston. This is a wooden hulled ship with uh, paddle wheels in the side, and of course, auxiliary sails, and very simple, very rudimentary um, boilers and steam engines. The bottom slide simply shows the Britannia being cut out of the ice in Boston Harbor. Uh, in the 1840s. As the century wears on, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the great uh, engineer from the UK, will build the Great Britain, what is regarded as the first iron-hulled, screw-propellered steamship. And indeed, uh, 1843, she's going to have the first propeller. Propellers are important over paddle wheels because propellers stay under the water in rough seas. They keep biting into the water and keep your ship in motion, unlike a paddle wheeler that rocks from side to side and the paddle wheels are out of the water. Uh, also, with paddle wheels, you can't get your ship close to the docks. So this is a, a market improvement over older technologies. Today, the Great Britain has been restored, and she sits in the original dry dock in Bristol, in which she was built, and is a great visit if you have a chance to get to Bristol, UK. As the century progresses, steamships also iron hulled get longer and longer. Boiler pressures, engines come up in terms of complexity and scope and size, but ships are still carrying auxiliary sails, and this is important because. We're still in the era of single propellered ships, and so propellers are known to fall off, propeller shafts are known to break, leaving you with no propulsion at all except your auxiliary sails. Keep in mind this is an era where there are no radios, and so there's really no way to contact anybody if you're floundering at sea unless someone happens to be going past you and you can signal them with uh, flags. As the century wears on, we get into something known as the the triple cylinder or the quadruple cylinder steam engine, more known as compound steam engines. Basically, someone has realized that uh, steam has a lot of power. So if you have multiple cylinders, and these are cylinders just like in your car, but in the case of your car where you have firing through the explosion of ignited gases or gasoline, in a compound steam engine, you simply force the movement of the cylinders through the introduction of steam into each cylinder. So in this case, on the left, you have steam fresh from the boilers. It's got the most power. It goes into a very small cylinder, but as it exits the cylinder, it has power still. There's plenty of energy in it. It expands a second larger cylinder, and then it might go on and expand a third cylinder. And in some cases, it might expand a fourth cylinder, which would be uh, a, um, a quad quadruple uh, steam engine or compound steam engine. And this is what they're starting to look like at the end of the 19th century. They've become massive. This is a triple expansion engine. You can see the tops of the three uh, cylinders at the very top of the green structure. But it'll give you an idea of the scope and size of these engines as we get into the late 19th century. These are the kind of engines that you would uh, see installed on the great steamships at that time, and particularly after the turn of the 20th century, Titanic, Olympic, which would have um, quadruple expansion steam engines. This is three. This is actually in Kempton Park, an old water pumping station outside of London. And indeed, you can visit this, you can walk around, and you can actually um, pay a small fee to be an operator for the day and actually admit the steam into the engine to run it. The next feature of expanding changes in the 19th century for marine technology, maritime technology, comes through Sir Charles Parsons, the famous Scottish engineer. And what Parsons do does is he will develop the marine turbine. Now, a turbine is simply something of a rotary nature, either an old windmill, windmill or a water wheel. Today, we might think of it as a jet engine with a big fan and a cylinder, si series of cylinders and um, discs that run through the engine, or something um, like a wind turbine, something that spins and creates a mechanical rotation that connects to a gear system and actually does work. But what Parsons did was interesting. He created what's known as a radial, a radial turbine. He set a series of... Um, discs along a shaft. The discs are coated with little tiny blades, almost like little wings, and through this series of discs is shot some high-pressure steam, rotating the discs, and of course this the um, shaft that they sit on, which rotates mechanically a propeller or a pump or some other kind of mechanical uh, device to do work. Now, how do you sell such a thing? Well, Parsons was a very smart man, and um, you know, in order to get R&D and get him onto the world stage, he does something very audacious. Every year, 
in Great Britain, there is a fleet review at Spithead, which is in the south of England off Portsmouth. And all of the Navy ships will line up, merchant ships will line up, private ships will line up, and the king will watch from the shore as there's a very large review in front of him showing the might and the power and the glory of British sea power and the merchant marine. So what Parsons does is he builds a small ship he calls Turbinia. She's 105 feet long, 9 feet wide, uh, 3 feet under the water, and she has a massive steam pressure and she basically uh, has a turbine system in her that is something that is brand new that he's trying to show off and he jumps out into the review in 1897 the turbine is on the right in the next slide and he rockets across the gathered warships at about 34 knots this is something that's never been done before it is the fastest anything has ever moved on the water and local craft the navy included try to make chase but they can't because he's so fast and he's gotten the attention of everybody, including the Royal Navy. This is Turbinia today as she sits up in Newcastle upon Tyne. You can visit her and she's been beautifully restored. And you see the ship that's really responsible for kicking off the high speed race on the ocean. The Navy, the Admiralty has taken notice very quickly. They build two test platforms with turbine propulsion. This is um, the Viper, Her Majesty's Destroyer, which, as you can see, is belching coal smoke and traveling at a high rate of speed. So the writing was on the wall. This new technology would replace the reciprocating engines in very short order. This is uh, an example of what a big turbine looks like. Um, this would be the size of a turbine in a very large merchant vessel, for example, or maybe even a naval vessel. This particular example is probably from an, on, an on, uh, onshore facility. But basically, you shoot high pressure steam through all of these veins, rotating this whole shaft and doing work. Back across the channel in Germany, you have two major steamship lines in Germany. You have the North German Lloyd, known as Norddeutscher Lloyd or NDL. Uh, and of course, the other one we've spoken of is the Hamburg America line. The North German line is um, steady and very um, responsive to change in the 19th century. And even though they don't go the turbine route initially, they build some of the most fantastic ships the world has ever seen. Very long hulls, first use of four smoke sacks, and just gloriously ornate in every way, shape, and form, and fast. They're twin screwed vessels, they have reciprocating engines. And they snatched the speed record from the UK, from Britain, for the first time uh, in many, many years. For most of the 19th century, Britain owns the speed records on the North Atlantic, with the exception of four short years when an American concern called the Collins Line had taken the record away. But nonetheless, the British had rest, rested that uh, record back. And all of a sudden, this rising power, led by... Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who is the grandson of their former Queen Victoria, or their current Queen Victoria still at this time, uh, all of a sudden the Germans are rising up and they're challenging Great Britain, and this is a big deal. So the British are knocked back on speed records. They, the Germans have four ships in a row which take the record of the North Atlantic, and Britain is very annoyed with this, and they're also very concerned that this new nascent power has challenged what has been regarded as the country that owns the supremacy of the seas, at least for many, many years. And this is where you really start to get the term greyhounds of the sea. These are the fastest, thing, fastest ships, the fastest things ever built by man, and they're just amazing. The stacks, that you can't really see in this picture, the stacks are paired, this gap between the second and the third funnel. Uh, and Hamburg America itself, through Albert Ballin, will get on this kick with the four funneled uh, steamers and Hamburg America will build the Deutschland and Albert Ballin's Deutschland is gorgeous it's absolutely beautifully ornate inside uh, it's catering to the first class passengers on the North Atlantic coming from Germany it also has copious room in the in the belly um, of the ship for immigrants and so Ballin gets into it and quickly Hamburg America steals the record from their rivals North German Lloyd next slide is a beautiful picture of several of the twin uh, the twin paired stacked steamers here and the reason these stacks are separated between two and three are to give the interior designers plenty of room in the belly of the ship to do this to build magnificent public rooms that soar through multiple decks which extend up to the top of the ship with beautiful glass skylights bringing natural light way down into the belly of the ship and making for a few instances 
or instance the passengers to forget that they're on the stormy North Atlantic. But these ships are absolutely beautiful. They're absolutely sumptuous. These are period postcards with color. Um, and you can see that uh, Balin pulls out all the stops. Money is no object. And um, he's going to create the most fabulous vessels ultimately in Hamburg America's line that the world has ever seen. Back in the United States, you might recognize this gentleman, uh, J.P. Morgan. He's a financier. He uh, comes from a financial background. His, his father was a financier and banker before him. Comes up and he becomes a very important um, part of the American economic landscape. He creates a series of major corporations, including one that is the first American corporation or corporation to exceed a billion dollars in revenue, and that's U.S. Steel. He will also work with other barons who own the railroads to sort of fix the railroad problem. One thing to remember is that railroads, when they were built in the United States in the 19th century, were built by private corporations. They're not government-sponsored entities. So you have many, many railroads competing uh, with different tracks that are owned by different companies. And they get into these nasty rate wars. And this is really decimating the whole industry. So J.P. Morgan gets together with his fellow um, railroad owners and he has interest in railroads himself and he creates basically a conference or a group a trade group that the owners can sit down in and, and you know hash out their differences but also to try to stabilize rates because the cutthroat rates are killing the business and they're putting they're putting people out of um, and companies out of uh, commission and it's just not healthy and he realizes that and when he gets this under control he turns his eyes to the north atlantic and figures that well if i can control railroad cargo carrying, I can certainly do something about all the commerce that's coming in across the Atlantic Ocean, which ultimately will link up to the railroads. In 1902, he forms a new organization called International Mercantile Marine. You can think of it today similar to what the Carnival Corporation is like, where Carnival has gone and bought up a lot of steamship lines. Same thing with International Mercantile Marine, IMM for short. J.P. Morgan starts going around the world across the ocean and starts plucking up steamship lines. He grabs the American line first, Atlantic Transport, Red Star from Belgium, White Star in the UK, um, and he goes after a number of lines, including Cunard, he goes after Hamburg America, he goes after North German Lloyd, and of course, all of a sudden, the European um, agencies that run these ships are getting a little bit nervous, primarily because the Americans are getting involved, and what's that going to do, ultimately, for the European lines if the Americans somehow disrupt their ability to have ships that work for them. In other words, in Great Britain, for example, um, steamships were already being taken over by the British Admiralty in time of war to be armed merchant cruisers. And so having an American thrust into this made the British very, very nervous about their supremacy, certainly in this regard. And so even though White Star Line has been bought up, Cunard gets very nervous about this and goes to the government and begs the government to help them out because they feel if they're taken over by uh, J.P. Morgan, British shipping is going to be ultimately decimated and ultimately be in the hands of the Americans. So Cunard goes to the government and the government agrees to front Cunard um, a significant amount of money to build new ships. Keep in mind by the end of the 19th century, shipbuilding is a very uh, expensive enterprise, particularly when the sizes are getting as great as they are. And uh, Cunard and other companies can't do it alone. They're all in it for the government subsidy at some point. But there's a trade-off being that the government will take these ships over in time of war as admiralty cruisers. So as Cunard gets a loan, secures a loan from uh, the British government, we go into the era of the three-ship weekly service. And Cunard plans a big three. Here's, here's an instance in this talk where we have a series of three. And it's going to be three ships that do a weekly service. And basically it will be Lusitania, Mauritania, and later the third ship a few years later will be Aquitania. A weekly service is basically set up so that you have a ship in port on either end, on either side of the ocean, and one in the middle. You have to also recall that in this era, it is the era of coal-driven ships. Uh, it is takes several days to reprovision a ship with coal, water, all laundry service in this era is taken off to local shoreside laundries. It's not a self-contained world like the ships of today. So you need time to refresh and replenish each port, and in order to do that, you need three ships, and you basically need ships that are traveling 23 to 24 knots. Otherwise, you will not be able to sustain a one-week service. This is an interesting shot. This is Mauritania, which will be the uh, second of the three-ship series for Cunard, sitting next to 
Sir Charles Parsons' little turbinia that led the revolution for turbine technology just a few years earlier. Here we see the beautiful first sister in the trio. This is Lusitania steaming at speed. Lusitania coming in uh, to New York uh, at the Cunard Pier in Chelsea uh, on her maiden voyage. Another shot of Lusitania at the pier, just giving you a, a sense of size compared to the crowds on the pier. Mauritania, the second sister, with her big, huge ventilators, meant to gulp air to fuel the furnaces down below, which would burn 1,100 tons of coal per day to push her at four and a half days across the Atlantic. And this is also what you've gotten when you've gotten, you have these big hulls that have been developed. You have plenty of space for interior of designers to do their work. And we're now in the era of the floating palace, especially for the millionaires, where uh, these ships are looking like land-based mansions and country houses, and basically meant to make travelers forget that they're on the ocean. And of course, to attract the cream of the crop, uh, who can afford to stay in this kind of luxury. The staterooms are just beautifully appointed. They have a lot, many of them have private sitting areas in the first class. On the upper right, you see a second class lounge, which is no less ornate. And on the bottom right, you have space for steerage or third class passengers. But these ships come at a tremendous cost, and that cost isn't the, the cost of the fuel it takes to run them. This is a contemporary graphic showing you Mauritania and the many, many carloads of coal it will take to fuel this ship to make her run at an excessive speed across the North Atlantic. In terms of what coaling looks like, this is the White Star Line's um, Oceanic uh, of 1899-1900, and you can see the coal ports are all open along the hull, ready to be filled with coal. And with coal comes the need for a huge engineering department. Some of these ships are running at three to 400 uh, men in the black gang, so-called because their faces are always covered with black coal dust. Three to 400 people, an enormous payroll to run the steam plants on these vessels. Well, it's very expensive to run a steam plant like this because the more the more knots you try to eke out of your ship, the huge coal consumption, it's just monstrous. It goes up and up and up. And so the White Star Line, which is the competition to Cunard, decides, well, we're not going to be able to be to compete on speed. We're going to let Cunard have that, but we're going to compete on luxury and size. And indeed, the second series of three ships is designed for the White Star Line, Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic, the third sister. They'll be the largest steamships in the world. They'll also be just ornate beyond belief. And they're going to take the cream of the, cre the crop of the um, first class passenger traffic. And they're also going to have hu ho huge holds dedicated to the immigrant trade. Again, this is the era of PR. We see Olympic standing up um, against the new Woolworth building, which is the tallest building in the world at 750 feet. Just amazing how long these vessels are getting. And the graph at the bottom from the left shows you where we started with wooden hulled paddle wheel steamers in Britannia and we've gone up exponentially as the 19th century has progressed to ultimately culminating in Olympic which is on top of this in 1910 Imperator which is uh, going to be the first of the Hamburg America line trio of ships and then eventually a ship that they project at least at this time to exceed 1,083 feet in 1920. This won't actually happen by 1920. The 1,083 uh, foot mark will be only um, surpassed in 2004 with the building of Queen Mary II. Well, here it is. We're finally at the era of the super floating palaces. This is the RMS Olympic. This is the first sister in the trio of beautiful White Star Line ships from 1911. This is just shy of 900 feet. Uh, length is 882 feet. Um, huge height, 175 feet from keel to the frontal tops, big drafts, almost 35 feet. But more importantly, uh, a crew capacity of 950 and a total capacity for passengers of crew and crew at 3,540 feet with 1,026 feet in steerage. <clears throat> Absolutely amazing um, amount of uh, capacity for these new ships. Now, the Cunard ships are all turbine. They're fully turbine, the three sisters, Lusitania, Mauritania, and Aquitania. Cunard has gone all in, but the White Star Line is a little bit reluctant to do that, and what they basically do is they install two of those large reciprocating compound engine, engines you saw earlier in the presentation. One of those per funnel for the two outer funnels, and then the middle funnel will be a turbine. So the ships are kind of a Frankenstein of technology, and um, perhaps not as up-to-date as their Cunard rivals will be. 
The second ship in the series, of course, is Titanic. We're familiar with that. Uh, built to the same plan largely as the Olympic, again, with about 3,500 passengers aboard, including crew, about 1,000 in steerage. And then you can see in the bottom slide the beautiful sisters Olympic and Titanic in Belfast in March of 1912. The third sister, of course, will be the HMS Britannic. She is never going to see commercial service. She's going to be launched during World War I. She'll be outfitted as a hospital ship, and sadly, she'll sink in 1916 off of Greece after hitting a mine. Now, when Kaiser Wilhelm II ascends to the throne, he is someone who is the grandson of Queen Victoria. His mother is Victoria's oldest daughter, Victoria, and his father is obviously German. He's very frustrated by his, his um, sort of dual roots. He really appreciates the power, the might, the pageant, uh, and the majesty of Britain, but he realizes he is the leader of Germany, and so he has to make his own way with this new unified nation. And what he does very quickly is to challenge uh, the land of half of his ancestors anyway, Great Britain, uh, by starting a huge naval arms race that starts in the late 1890s and will culminate uh, in the First World War. But on this graph, you can see that in 1906, Germany, the second line from the left, or the third line from the left with the, with the triangles, in 1906, Germany is just starting their naval buildup. And then by 1908, the German line crosses the red line for England. So the two are building at the same speed by 1908. Of course, England's um, Navy production takes off, warship production takes off tremendously and continues through 1918 while the Germans plateau off uh, at some point, um, you know, in the mid-teens. But it's an incredible accomplishment for a, a unified Germany that didn't even exist until 1871 and had no navy to speak of until that time. The British are very wary about this. They don't like the saber-rattling rat saber across the channel, um, and they're very concerned that Germany is catching up with Britain on all things navy. It's a time of tremendous imperialism all over the world. All the major powers are building huge navies. We have the Great White Fleet of Roosevelt here in the United States. Uh, everybody's cutting up their piece of the earth, their piece of the pie. And of course, Kaiser Wilhelm II no doubt wants as much as he can get his hands, or in this case, teeth, onto. Meanwhile, Albert Ballin, the director now of Hamburg America, the managing director, is very content to stay in the commercial realm. He knows and feels and understands instinctively that war is not good for any business. The resources of a country that are poured into war will take away from everything else, and ultimately you are probably going to go down a bad path if you're all in for war. But he believes in commercial enterprise. He feels that's the road to peace. And he continues, of course, building up the great Hamburg America company, certainly with an eye to immigration. That was where he came from as a young man. But also for the luxury and the notoriety of having this great steamship line represent the new unified Germany to the entire world. The steamship um, company's motto is Mein Feld is the Welt, my field is the world. And you can see that over there, a little door to their offices in Cuxhaven, Germany. And also there's a little march that's developed to uh, go along with that. So it's interesting how much this PR is sort of circulating through uh, Hamburg, America, uh, as they grasp a global outreach to be a, pre a preeminent steamship line. Now, Albert Ballin, as he gets to be an older man, he's, he's not close to the Kaiser in terms of being friends, but he's very cordial to him. And he... He stays in touch with the Kaiser uh, because, number one, you have to get the Kaiser's permission for certain things, particularly if you're going to use imperial names on ships, but also because he knows that this is the power behind the throne. This is the throne, and certainly if Hamburg America wants to make great strides, they need to be in the emperor's pocket, so to speak. So he does everything he can. He loans the emperor's ships during certain naval reviews. Uh, he's just very cordial to him. He, he kowtows to him to some degree and tries to do everything he can to, to keep the Kaiser from talking about military might and expressing to the Kaiser the importance of having a strong commercial merchant marine. Uh, we see the picture at the top with Albert Ballin and the Kaiser on um, a new steamship that has come out of Hamburg, America. And at the bottom, they are just leaving the launching of the third of Albert Ballin's big, huge trio, uh, the Bismarck. And of course, Albert Ballin is going to continue to push the Hamburg America line to be one of the foremost steam steamship companies in Germany, if not the world. As we get into the 20th century, we have the rise of two sets of ships, of 
three ships, two sets of three ships, one for Cunard, Lusitania, Mauritania, and Aquitania, the three ship service. And then we have the same for the White Star Line, a little bit more palatial. We have Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic. Well, Ballin is going to go the same way for the Germans. He's going to build a trio of super liners that are going to exceed even the size of the White Star Line trio. And this is going to push Germany uh, to the forefront of steamship operations in terms of strength, speed, luxury, and certainly the ability to carry a lot of passengers, particularly immigrants. Albert has never forgotten about the immigrant trade. Again, as a reminder, this is the bread and butter of the steamship lines. So he's going to go and he's going to propose three ships, and they're ultimately going to be Imperator, Vaterland, and the Bismarck. He goes to the king, to the Kaiser, and he says, I'd like to name the first ship Europa. Albert Ballon's thinking is that we're part of a huge collective in, Ger in um, as a unified nation of Germany in Europe, and we should be a player. And to do that, let's keep it mellow. Let's not get any. Let's not get too um, too involved in our own German naming structure. Let's call it Europa. Let's be a player on the team. And the Kaiser rejects that and says, "No, I want the first ship named after me, Imperator, Emperor." And what can Albert Ballon do except acquiesce? By the time of the second ship, several years later. Albert Ballin goes back to the emperor and tries again. He says, you know, your majesty, I'd like to name the second ship Europa. And the emperor comes back and says, well, you know, Albert, it's been really difficult as we've unified because I lead Prussia um, and our colleagues down in the southeast in Bavaria have never really been happy with the arrangement. Moreover, when I had Otto von Bismarck, he was pursuing this real politic goal of his. He was shaking out the Catholics in the southern part of the country. We're Protestant. There's a lot of um, saber-rattling going on within Germany, which is not good for us. Let's not call the ship Europa. Let's call it Vaterland, Fatherland. Uh, let's try to present this unified face. And in fact, I'm not even going to launch the ship. I'm going to invite the leader of Bavaria to launch it so they feel part of the collective Imperial Germany. The third ship, of course, will be named uh, ultimately Bismarck after Otto von Bismarck, who led Germany to its unification and set, on a, set it on a, a world goal as a major international player. So Imperator will be the first ship that is built. It is built at the AG Vulcan shipyards in Germany, which is now uh, a part of Poland. Um, in this slide, we can see Kaiser Wilhelm descending the launch platform under the Great Hall on May 23rd, 1912. Interestingly, this date is important because it's only five weeks after the Titanic disaster. So that disaster is going to force multiple changes in, into the thinking of ship designers going forward. Nonetheless, the build-out of the Imperator proceeds. She's a monster ship, beautiful lines. We have this beautiful colorized photo uh, that gives you a little bit more detail when the color is, is uh, painted onto an existing black and white picture. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous ship, uh, monster, monster proportions. Again, here you see her in the floating dock, the Schwimm dock, uh, in the Vulcan shipyard. They didn't have dry docks large enough to take these big ships at the time, so they would often take one or more, usually more, for the ship of this size of the floating dry docks, and they would mate them together, and they would be able to accommodate a ship of this size, which, of course, is um, just over 900 feet long, the first ship that will exceed a length of 900 feet. And again, this is just after the Titanic disaster. Um, you know, the world is just preoccupied with safety and the tragedy of Titanic. Um, this famous photograph was actually taken in London just after the disaster. And the young man that you see here, his name was Ned Parfit. He's actually, believe it or not, 16 years old in this photograph. Um, and he will go on to die in World War I uh, just six years later at the age of 22. Um, but he'll forever be remembered as the little boy with the sign uh, in Titanic. But Imperator launches, she comes out of the shipyard, she cuts a beautiful figure, and you can see part of the issue that with Titanic that's come out of it. You can see a series of nested lifeboats on basically what is the promenade deck. Uh, they're tucked into the hull. Uh, this is a feature that is used today on cruise ships. Uh, part of that is to lower the center of gravity um, on the ship and make it a little bit more stable. Um, there will be a vast number of uh, stacked lifeboats up in the forward part of the ship. She will have 83 lifeboats in total uh, with uh, lifeboats for all. There's, there's no going back to the, the pre-Titanic era. Don't forget Titanic and her sisters, uh, which are almost the same size as this ship, had only 20 lifeboats, 16 wooden lifeboats, and four half-wooden lifeboats with raisable 
canvas size. So a marked difference by having four times the amount of lifeboats to be able to carry all passengers. Now, the interesting thing about the Imperator is that when she's launched uh, at the Vulcan shipyard, she's, she's unstable. It's very quickly determined that she's a tender ship. She cants over, she heals over when her hull, when her, uh, her wheel is turned, and it's determined that she's top heavy. So even having the lifeboats on the promenade deck wasn't enough to help Imperator. And basically her funnel tops were cut down. Some of the heavier um, design elements like marble on the top decks was removed. She had tons of pig iron poured into her holds, a lot of concrete poured down there as well. And it helped to stabilize her, but she was always a little bit more of a tender ship than her later two sisters. But nonetheless, she cuts a beautiful line. Um, and indeed, in this ship, in this picture, you can see her. She's she's sort of slightly, I think, inclined to the starboard. But you know that could be wrong. That could be wrong. But it does look like she's canted over a little bit. But the buff funnels of the Hamburg America line, and in the front, you can see the Big Eagle. The controversy at the time was Aquitania was being built um, in England, and no one was sure how long, how big the Aquitania was going to be, and the Germans didn't want to take any chances. And even though they knew the ship, this ship would be greater than 900 feet, um, it's 906 or 909, depending on your source, they didn't want to take any chances because they didn't know what the ultimate length of Aquitania would be. So they went out and hired a sculptor and slapped this big eagle on the front, uh, which you can see in a contemporary publication, which added a, approximately 10 feet to the ship's length, um, giving her the definitive title of longest ship in the world, which is kind of crazy because Lloyd's Register, the great insurer in London, didn't really care about mm -hmm. ornamentation. They just cared about length between perpendiculars. But nonetheless, she got that distinction. And in fact, the globe that the eagle sits on says, Mein Feld ist die Welt. My field is the world, the Hamburg America Line PR logo. But the poor eagle didn't do well, and her wings were clipped, or his wings were clipped after a few North Atlantic storms, and he was summarily removed not to be returned again to the hull. A quick look at the two second sisters in each of the trios, the White Star Line trio and, of course, the Hamburg America trio, will show that the Vaterland, the second sister in the Hamburg America Line, uh, has exceeded 900 feet finally by a lot. She's 950 feet long. She's the first ship to hit triple digits on the beam or the width. She's 100 feet wide and she's 184 feet from the bottom of her keel to the top of her funnels with a 37 foot draft. Her gross registered tonnage, which is a reflection of interior volume uh, in cubic feet, is 54,190 and she can carry a staggering 5,434 passengers including a crew of 1,234. Uh, it's a huge accomplishment with space for 2,860 immigrants down in the holds and very comfortable space too. Ballon has not forgotten uh, the folks for whom he first worked. Unlike the White Star Line trio, the Hamburg America Line trio are fully turbined. There's no reciprocating engine technologies. They're all into the turbines and they have four four-bladed propellers, um, unlike the White Star Line's three, three, three wheels, three propellers, and they have a comfortable service speed of 22 to 23 knots, and again, lifeboats by far for all. One interesting feature and revolutionary feature in the second and third of the Ballon Trio, the big, the big trio, uh, which would be Vaterland and Bismarck, they're actually built at Blom and Voss shipyards in Hamburg. They're not build, built at AG Vulcan. And one of the things that's revolutionary that Blom and Voss comes up with is the notion of split funnel uptakes. As you can see at the bottom, you have your furnaces at the bottom of the ship. And when you, you exhaust the, um, the gases from the furnaces, normally they would go straight up through the center line of the ship, uh, right up a chimney, right out the stacks in the top, and off you went. But in order to do that, you basically wind up cutting up the passenger space or cutting up the space above your boilers and your engine room. Um, that the interior designers are going to be able to lay out into public rooms. By splitting the exhausts from the furnaces up along the sides of the ship and then reattaching the flues above the major passenger spaces at the base of the funnel, it gives the interior designers tremendous leeway with designing interior space. You have plenty of unfettered uh, space to deal with when you're designing public rooms and that gives you the ability to, big, to build very long public rooms indeed. This is a plan of B-deck on the Vaterland. On the right is the bow of the ship. It starts off with the first public room being the library. And essentially you can walk through to the back of the ship. To, you can go right aft 
for about 400 feet without having to walk into a wall or there's a funnel extending up through the ship. You can see there are four uptakes. Um, these are the split uptakes. And this gives the interior designers a lot of leeway in order to build huge, contiguous public spaces. Vatalon is launched on April 3rd, 1913. And the gentleman walking along the hull in the right-hand picture, the, the man, man in the middle is uh, Prince Ruprecht. He is of Bavaria. He's attending in place of Kaiser Wilhelm II. And the other two gentlemen are Blom and Voss of the shipyard. The ship slides down the way. She's a beautiful streamlined figure. You can see her, uh, her propeller bossings, her propeller shafts coming out on the right in the bottom of the hull. And just a glorious, a glorious figure with the imperial flag flying at the stern. The ships are a little bit different. On the left upper upper picture, that's Imperator. You can see her, her forward uh, superstructure, somewhat unremarkable. Um, she has a lot of immigrants on her front deck with a lot of the passenger luggage, as you can see, stacked up. The other two ships, the Vachelon, the second sister, and the Bismarck, the third sister, will have this very powerful flat front superstructure with extended bring, bridge wings, almost like a like a hammerhead shark, you know, with the two eyes projecting off the head. Very powerful, very blunt, very masculine. Uh, Vatalan will have a little additional feature at the top uh, around her bridge windows where she's got this beautiful dark stained wood, uh, varnished wood. Uh, just adds a little bit more uh, decor to the front of the ship and breaks up all that white on the superstructure. Going back to Sir Charles Parsons, this is an example of the huge turbine, one of the four installed on Vatalan. Another uh, feature that was on Vatalan and Bismarck was the notion of these ventilation holes in the third funnel. Uh, this is because we have huge fans drawing in air, which is going down and pressurizing the boiler room. You have natural draft up, a, up these huge stacks, up these chimneys, that draws air in through the fireboxes so you can burn your coal. But you, you need to when you suck air out of a space, you need to replace it, and that's the point of these vents. You're sucking air in from the inside. You're adding a light pressure to the environment of the fire, uh, the fire room, and keeping the air flowing for combustion, which is really, really important. Um, and indeed, you can see that Vatalan cuts a beautiful, beautiful figure here in um, replacement color, digital color. Um, might add this one note that the Germans started off the um, four stack ships with the North German Lloyd in the 1870s. By this time, we've gotten back to three stacks. Now, the White Star Line did four stacks. The British trio of uh, liners, Lusitania, Aquitania, Mauritania, did four stacks. But the important thing to know uh, with the White Star Line ships was that the, th the fourth funnel was a dummy funnel. It was there to create symmetry, to, to provide proportion for these ultra long hulls. And also it, it was something that the immigrants could look to and say, ah, three funnels are good, four funnels are better. So it was also a, a PR ploy in some respects. But these ships, the German uh, trio of Ballon superliners, only required two funnels to exhaust their boiler gases. The third funnel is again a dummy. Uh, it is functional, but it doesn't exhaust boiler um, emissions or furnace emissions. It exhausts um, smells from the galleys, the kitchens. There's some miscellaneous equipment in there, so it's not a working funnel. Again, here we see Vachelin prior to her maiden voyage. She cuts a beautiful, beautiful figure. And again at the pier in Cuxhaven before going off on her maiden voyage on May 14th, 1914, heading over to America. Just a quick side note too, in a mere 15 years, we'll see the difference in liner size. The liner on the left is the Victoria Louise, the former Deutschland that Albert, uh, Albert Ballin had built uh, at the turn of the century. But in a mere 14, 15 years, you can see how liner technology has developed and they have grown exponentially. Nice, interesting uh, advertisements for the new Vachelan and Imperator. And of course, uh, another novelty at the time, a blimp. The two fiery swords, as they're known in Germany, are on the seas together. Imperator with her eagle ornamentation on the right, Vatalan on the left. A nice shot of Vatalan's bow with her big 12-ton bow or centerline anchor. Extensive uh, gold ornamentation around the imperial eagle on the bow. And then again, how the Germans really put the money into decor and decoration. Most of these hull letters you see on most ships are flat plate steel, but they have really beautiful raised steel on their letters, uh, no expense spared. 
again, I'm just to give you the relative size of the bow in the hull, this is a pilot uh, boarding. Uh, and you can see there, the huge superstructure up on the left. Um, long, long climbs to these pilots. These are huge, huge hulls. A quick shout out to Hans Reusser. Hans Reusser is the Commodore of the Hamburg America line. He is the German equivalent of E.J. Smith of White Star Line. And Commodore Reusser, who's 52 at the time of the Vachelens maiden voyage, will take out all three sisters, Imperator, Vachelen, and later Bismarck, which is completed after the war. He's pictured with his officers on the beautiful wood panel bridge of uh, Vachelen, and of course at the bottom and behind the beautiful wooden windscreen with a large open bridge behind him. And these ships, of course, cut a very impressive figure. figure. Uh, again, added color, but it gives you an idea of the, um, the tremendous width of the uh, boat decks, the promenade decks. All these passenger spaces are just magnificently huge. And, of course, Ballon is not going to let uh, ostentation get away from him either. He's met um, a French hotel designer by the name of Charles New, who will design a lot of great hotels um, in Europe, but he'll also design the interior for a number of liners. And one thing that Ballon has done is look to luxury for the first class passengers. And he's, he's hooked up with um, Cesar Ritz, who all, you know has uh, started the Ritz-Carlton chain. And indeed, what they're going to do on Vatelon is they're going to duplicate the Ritz-Carlton Hotel here seen in New York on the ship. And it will look like this, uh, which is really, really spectacular. Uh, just absolute attention to detail, um, the finest materials you can buy finest craftsmanship uh, to make the first class passengers feel absolutely on home in the ocean. Um, I think the important thing is that you know you 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 look at this in terms of um, how you sell your ship. You're going to sell to the first class passengers certainly but um, you're going to also have that huge immigrant trade down in, in the belly of the ship too and we're not going to forget them. We're going to start with a little mind exercise. I did mention that you could on these newer ships basically walk for about 400 feet thanks to the split uptakes, the split flues that let the interior designers build these huge ships, or huge interior spaces rather. So in the next slide we're going to be in the same room, which is the Ritz-Carlton um, dining room, looking in the opposite direction. And you're looking out into another room, which is the Palm Court or the Winter Garden. Uh, this is a feature on these early ships that made you think you were in a conservancy surrounded by flowers. So we're going to walk backwards through the ships. Uh, through the ship, um, all 400 feet. I'll take you through a number of rooms and you can see what it looks like when you have unfettered, unrestricted spaces. So if we cross over the Ritz-Carlton and we go down the stairs at the other end and look back towards the Ritz-Carlton, this is the view. This is a period color autochrome from 1918 and it shows you the lush decor in the Palm Court or the Winter Garden looking back towards the Ritz-Carlton um, dining room. If you continue sort of walking backwards away from the Ritz-Carlton dining room, further out into the Palm Court, you'll see the stairs that you just came down in the background. And if we exit the room behind us, you're in a little entryway here. Again, look way down. You can see the stairs that go up to the back of the Palm Garden into the Ritz-Carlton restaurant. If we were now to swing to the left, you're in this beautiful lobby area. You see a staircase immediately uh, across from you and to the left of the staircase reflected in the mirror is the staircase on the opposite side. You have natural light above your head through the skylight. You have this gallery on the next level um, that connects the staircases. And again, this is a first class passenger lobby. If you continue swinging to the left, you'll see this door which takes you into the beautiful social hall, the largest room on the ocean. And if we proceed through this door and turn around, this is the view on Vatiland. A number of people sitting and enjoying tea or coffee, um, beautiful panel woodwork, beautiful glass skylight that has natural lighting from above and it will be lit from behind in the evening. You can make out um, light at the top of the cove molding uh, shining upward, uh, big windows, four enormous oils by uh, 18th century Flemish painter that were donated to the ship by the Kaiser himself. And if we turn around to look at the room the other way, you can see how large this space is. There's about 2,500 square feet in this room alone. The big oil, oil paintings, again, you can see on the other wall a little bit more clearly. Uh, there's an entertainment stage at the end, and of course, if you're going to be entertained, who better to entertain you than the Kaiser himself uh, in this little statue that's been erected there of him in his kind of silly war outfit with the eagle on his head. Um, 
Nonetheless, here's a period color from 1918 in the same room, and you can again see the, the lusciousness of the colors, the fabrics, uh, just a beautiful, beautiful space. And if we were to exit the doors at the rear by the stage, uh, excuse me, we would be in another first class lobby with little seating areas. And if you were to continue through, you'd be in the library. Uh, beautiful library, several thousand books, a very comfortable space, lots of natural light from either side of the ship. Uh, and you've now walked about 400 feet from the stern forward to this room. If you were to extend the stairs above this room, you'd be in a first class smoking room. Beautiful paneled uh, wooden walls, carved woodwork everywhere. A beautiful fireplace, which is not real, but it can be lit up at night to make you think you're sitting in front of your uh, manor house fireplace. And lots of carved wood, lots of carved inset spaces. Uh, there's two seating nooks, one on either side. This one I think is on the port side, and you can see in the nook there are these, there are these um, two figures called the Old Salts. There's four of them total in the room, two on each side, and these have um, just meaning for the mariner. They're uh, little mariners in their little oilskin outfits. One's holding a hemp rope, one's holding a compass and some tools, but they have uh, they've been put in there to um, give you the feel that despite it being a big ocean liner, you're still very much at sea, and these little spirits will look over everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to have one of these in my personal collection, which I'll show you at the end of the slide deck. This is down on F deck. This is the major uh, dining room. Uh, it is uh, accessible from a staircase at the end where you can descend in all your finery for the evening in front of your fellow passengers. It has a deck height of 31 feet. 31 feet, an amazing accomplishment because you have this uh, unlimited use of space for the interior designers to work with thanks to the split frontal uptakes. This is a scene at night uh, in the same room with everyone eating very happily. This is from the ship's German days. And as a comparison, here is the dining room on the White Star Line ships, which had a, a maximum deck height of about 13 feet. Uh, so big, big difference between 31 feet in spaciousness and 13 feet here. Nonetheless, a very beautiful room at sea for the White Star Line traveler. Again, just a little poke again at the White Star Line. This is the pool of the White Star Line. Nice, one of the earliest pools on the um, Atlantic Ocean, but almost an afterthought when you compare it to the Pompeian pools and just the beautiful tile work of the Hamburg America Line ships uh, seen here on the Vaterland, where you have just lots of tile work, beautiful, elaborate decor, uh, showers for your after pool uh, swim, um, and a gallery upstairs where you can look over and watch the swimmers down below you. These are creations also based on uh, the Royal Automobile Club by Charles Mia in, in London, which is still around, and you can get an idea for the sense of beauty that was installed here and then transferred over onto the ocean. Looking at some of the other rooms on the Vaterland, the second class dining hall is nice. Almost the same deck height as the White Star Line first class dining room, very beautiful. Uh, an example of a second class stateroom, second class lounge, and then the second class smoking room. And of course, Ballin hasn't forgotten the immigrants for whom he started his career, or with whom he started his career. These are immigrants on the, f uh, on the forward uh, deck of Imperator with all of their luggage. And certainly you can see that the immigrant spaces on Vaterland are comfortable. They're not ostentatious. They're very plain. But in, indeed, some of the best accommodation that these folks will ever have seen with am ample food. Uh, and, you know, comfortable and safe sleeping arrangements. Bathtubs, private bathtubs, private showers, nice wash rooms, and then, of course, a special facilities uh, facility for the immigrants uh, to allow them to wash their laundry, big tubs. You can see some of the safety appliances on the Vachalan. These are the nested lifeboats we saw in Imperator. They're tucked into what normally would have been um, some sort of a boat deck or promenade space, but they had to be given over to boats, otherwise they wouldn't be able to have enough uh, facilities for uh, passengers in time of an emergency. One of the most powerful spotlights ever installed at sea, which is being tested here before installed up on the main mast. You can see the Vachalan doing a lifeboat test. These are stacked three lifeboats um, with special dabs to be able to carry them out over each other. And then one of the most important features of the ship is the very powerful wireless room with uh, multiple receivers, multiple frequencies, and of course, man, 24-7, 365, the most powerful transmitter on the ocean at this point. 
But for Vodulin, kind of a short service history, only about 11 weeks. She does three complete round trips. On the fourth uh, trip over, she comes westbound. She enters um, New York, Hoboken, in July, July 29th, 1914. And the news had come over the wireless the day before, July 28th, 1914, of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria in Sarajevo by a Bosnian dissident. And this is going to be the spark that leads to World War I. Uh, the De Vautelin, certainly, and other German ships are told to stay put because it is expected that Germany might enter the war. And if that's the case, these ships could be attacked by the British if they tried to get back to their homeland. So until things shook out, they wanted them to stay put, and indeed they did. And uh, unfortunately for Vautelin, she would never sail again under the flag of Germany. And this is the point where we go back to Otto von Bismarck, the German chancellor, who set up all these interesting alliances many years before, because now all these alliances are called into play. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of these things that if you touch my friend, I'm going to hit you. If you hit my friend's friend, I'm going to hit you. It's sort of a cascade effect. And indeed, from the uh, initial 28th of July, 1914, where Austria and Serbia go to war, uh, from the 1st of August right through the end of uh, October, the first service year of Vatiland, all of these countries jump into World War I. The United States won't enter the war until 1917. Um, it was a brutal era. We are helping out uh, Britain as best we can, but she suffers from blockade. She suffers from uh, submarine warfare, which is just decimating ocean liners and other merchant ships left and right. Lusitania is a prime example. One of the Cunard Line um, trio of ships is torpedoed in 1915 with great loss of life, including 120 Americans. The third of the um, White Star Line Sisters Britannic hits a mine in 1916 and, and never sees commercial service. 30 dead out of uh, 1,065. And of course the propaganda machine goes into great swing. In List, you see a woman with her baby sinking to the bottom of the ocean from Lusitania, and then of course remember the Lusitania, a worldwide tragedy that just st struck a chord everywhere. In 1916 in the United States, um, Congress decides it better do something because it's watching what's happening and it realizes that the American merchant marine is really a mess. Uh, there's something like 2,000 hulls, many of them antiquated, flying the American flag. 10% um, of all um, U.S. commerce is carried on American hull ships. Everything else is coming in on foreign ships. And this presents a problem because if the countries in Europe who are carrying your commerce go to war with each other and put their ships that are carrying your commerce aside for merchant duties or armed merchant duties, then your economy is going to crash and burn. So the Americans get in, involved by creating a United States shipping board um, and its related emergency fleet corporation. And this entity will try to codify the American merchant marine, start to build new hulls, and eventually take over all the seized German shipping uh, that is uh, frozen in the U.S. ports at the start of the war. Uh, and certainly I think everyone understands that, you know, you need ships for victory. You can't just uh, rest on your laurels even though you're across an ocean. Um, Edith Wilson, the president's wife, is tasked with renaming all the seized German tonnage. She gets a little confused when she gets to Vaterland and sees her stats and how big she is, and she's just flummoxed by this whole thing. So her husband just turns to her and says, hey, look, Leviathan, like in the Bible, it's a, it's a sea monster, and that's an appropriate name. And indeed, Leviathan becomes the ship's new name. The United States stays out of the war uh, until we see a return, unfortunately, in 1917 of unrestricted German submarine warfare. This is the point where the Germans are not giving warning to merchant vessels. They are just launching attacks. They are not allowing passengers that come off in lifeboats to survive. Uh, it's a brutal, brutal time, and they're, they're, they're targeting all countries. It's not just Britain anymore. Anything that comes into their, their scope or their sights is, is fair game. The final straw for the United States is the Zimmerman telegram. It was a communication sent from uh, the ambassador, the diplomats from Germany to Mexico, saying if uh, the U.S. enters the war against Germany, uh, if Mexico goes uh, to war with Germany against the United States, sides with Germany, then Mexico will recover Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. Well, this is too much, and indeed, war is declared on April 6, 1917 by the U.S. Congress. And mobilization starts in short order. Um, the United States Shipping Board and the Emergency Fleet Corporation get into the act. They, they take over all activities of U.S. shipyards. Recruiting of men to be trained to operate these vessels takes place. 
ship shipyard uh, work is totally concentrated on the war effort at this point. Everything is turned over to the war effort. And a great propaganda campaign begins to try to engage the American public that despite the distance between us and Europe, we need to go help our allies. The Vacheland is seized on April 6th when the U.S. goes to war. She's protected in the port of Hoboken. The German crew, the, the um, skeleton crew that's been on her for several years, three years while she's at port, is, is taken off. The American flag goes up over her stern on July 25th. And uh, she starts being painted in navy gray at the pier, and her new name quickly appears on her stern, Leviathan. Very, uh, very rapid turnover to a troop ship at the port. And I think it just begs a, a quick pause here to say that the ship hasn't moved in three years. There is really no dry dock big enough to handle her in the United States. And so when it's when it is taken that the Navy will run her as a, a troop carrier, the Navy has to figure her out. She's been at the pier for three years. They send teams and teams and teams aboard her to assess her condition. Uh, you know, what does it look like? There are no plans. There are no operating manuals. The ship has been dark largely for three years. They bring a crew in from General Electric to get her um, electrical plant back online. Navy engineers come back, uh, come in to try to get her turbines up and running. And everything has to be inspected. They have to know what every switch does, every valve does. Of course, everything is marked in German, which doesn't help. But um, they go in in very short order. They get her operational at the pier. They do a pier test, a trials test, where they basically un unhook her uh, propellers to see if they can get the steam plant to go up to a certain level. And there are some minor teething troubles. The Germans have not majorly sabotaged this ship, as was reported in propaganda at the time. There were other German ships that had been damaged. But Hans Reusser was a very well-known and well-respected mariner on both sides of the Atlantic, and a proud man. He was not about to let his ship be destroyed. Um, because who knew where the war would go, or how fast it would you know, be over, and why destroy this major German asset uh, in spite when ultimately it might be reused for its home country. So uh, the ship really just suffered more from benign neglect than anything else and she was reactivated at the pier in short order. She's being shown cold here with automatic coal um, chutes. And on her, one of her first trips she will go over to Liverpool. She would be put into the dry dock. Uh, the Americans will get the opportunity to see her hull, her underwater hull for the first time. And she'll be painted in a new dazzle scheme um, by British artist Norman Wilkerson, who develops the scheme. And you basically install geometric lines in all sorts of different colors. And it's meant to mask the lines of the vessel you're covering. So it doesn't make the vessel disappear, but it makes it harder to target at sea uh, when these colors blend into the different colors of water and sky. Uh, and there's some question as to how effective it was, but sailors uh, in the convoys at the time with Leviathan suggested that this really threw them off. They would have to sail around at different angles to try to figure out which direction the ship was headed. Here's images of her at sea in her uh, dazzle paint scheme. The lower image is of a brand new model being created for the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy Museum in Kings Point, Long Island. It is painted on one side in her wartime livery and on the opposite side, not pictured, is her U.S. line livery. And in short order, she's transported, transformed rather into the world's biggest transport, uh, brought back to Ho Hoboken, where no doubt her dazzle paint really wowed some of the people who'd never seen anything like that before. And off she goes to war. She carries thousands and thousands and thousands of troops on 10 trips over, uh, and they're packed on in every conceivable area. The ship while it was at Hoboken was taken over by the Navy. Um, everything below first class, first class was protected, but everything below first class was torn out. Every other passenger space, public rooms, accommodations was literally ripped out. Furniture was thrown overboard or some of it put into storage. Mirrors were broken. Um, bathtubs were broken with sledgehammers to get them off quickly. Everything was removed and the Americans uh, installed quickly about 10,000 standy bunks for troops to be transported with. They installed the sick bay. They upgraded galley facilities to be able to handle this huge amount of humanity in feeding. And they went to war very, very quickly in just a matter of months. Uh, and by December of 1917, she was pushed into war service um, and transports something like 149,000 troops over uh, 10 voyages. And then she'll do trooping back to bring them back as well. USS Imperador, run at the end of the war by the U United States and Leviathan, the, the two big German beauties, are at the pier in Hoboken towards the end of the war. 
Certainly you can see the amount of life um, jackets that are required for the troops. It's a minor miracle the ship never caught fire during her wartime. She has eight six inch guns. She has um, depth charge tubes on her stern. And she's just an amazing figure, absolutely huge. If you look between the stacks, you can see um, blackout. This is uh, an area where you would normally have skylights for the public rooms, but they've been painted black to eliminate any light from leaking from the ship that might signal a submarine at night. The starting platform down in the engine room that controls the mighty turbines. And of course, she's still a coal burner. You can see at Brest, France, the lighter with all the coal coming on board. Coal is loaded by hand in these days, a very, very messy and a very time consuming process. And of course, um, the black gang at work of firing one of her boilers. She has 46 boilers with five uh, fireboxes each down, down in the holds, uh, creating a steam pressure of 235 PSI to power those four massive turbines. Sick bay on the right top photograph is installed in the social hall. Standy bunks are put in throughout the ship, including on the open promenade decks. And a group of uh, soldiers is seen here during one of the voyages um, relaxing on the open air decks. She has a tremendous capacity to feed troops. She has 100 gallon kettles for soup and other uh, liquid, uh, liquid based foods. She has big, big uh, steam uh, jackets, if you will, or steam, I don't know what the right term for it is, but uh, chests that will uh, basically steam potatoes very quickly. Pie is a favorite apparently among the troops, the gobs on the ship. And of course, the beautiful uh, former palm court or palm uh, garden and the Ritz-Carlton restaurant are converted to uh, a restaurant or eating space or mess hall for uh, the officers. She does hold a record. Her record is feeding 9,000 troops in 65 minutes. They eat as they walk and as they get to the end of the dining room and they're finishing their meal, they will dip their tin canteens and tin trays into soapy water and then go back to their respective compartments. It's a huge operation. A couple of shots of her uh, inner wheelhouse with uh, some uh, Navy compasses and other gear attached to the wheel. Uh, the outside of, of course, the bridge. One of the six inch guns that we spoke about and then uh, the Navy is constantly running uh, lifeboat tests for safety. One thing that should be noted too is the, um, the rise of the Spanish flu in 1918. We have the coronavirus today and certainly there were something like 500 million people infected with the flu in um, World War I or in 1918. Uh, during one trip, uh, there were 11,800 folks aboard the Leviathan going to Europe, including 191 army nurses. And as they got out, they discovered they had more than 2,000 cases of flu, measles, and mumps. 99 individuals died on the, on the trip over to Europe, and um, another 966 were bedridden and sent inshore in France. So it's a tremendous tragedy with so many folks just tucked into all these nooks and crannies on the ship. Um, it's just an amazing, amazing thing that more people didn't die, but it was a very tragic time on all the troop carriers uh, because there was no way to prevent this from spreading. At the end of the war, 1919, she comes home. She carries uh, Pershing home uh, from the war theater. And uh, here's an example of a couple souvenirs you could buy of your of your ship. Uh, little pillow, sh pillow covers, pillow shams. Um, proud reminders of uh, the ship bringing you uh, either over or back from Europe. And just a, a little kind of a note, um, Leviathan's record was 14,300 troops. And this would be only surpassed by Queen Mary some 25 years later in World War II when she carried uh, 16,600 souls. But the War Service was 10 round trip voyages, about 120,000 troops, plus the crew, of course. Uh, record voyage west, 14,300 souls aboard. Record feeding of 9,000 meals in about 67 minutes. She transports 10,200 wounded home and earns the nicknames the Big Train and Levi Nathan. She comes back to Hoboken and she sits at the pier until the um, U.S. Shipping Board and the Emergency Fleet Corporation can figure out what to do with her and all the other interned German ships that we seized and are now back from the war. Um, and there's some thought of selling her to the International Mercantile and Marine after the war. This is the former J.P. Morgan Combine that owns all the shipping companies over in Europe. Um, and there's an outcry immediately from William Randolph Hearst, who's one of the big newspaper publishers in the country at this time. He has no use for the British. He is uh, an Anglophobe, and he feels that if International Mercantile and Marine, uh, through their American line, there is an American line on there that, that is um, headed by the, the Americans, and it's headed by 
IMM, which is actually an American-owned corporation, but all the other lines are British. But Hearst feels that if um, the Leviathan goes to IMM, that the British are ultimately going to take it over, and it's going to be a ship that flies the um, British flag at some point, and maybe even works for the British Admiralty at some point, against U.S. commercial interests and certainly against U.S. military interests. So he raises a huge campaign in his newspapers, and uh, he's very successful in getting the public tide and the tide of um, you know, public opinion in terms of um, legislatures to prevent the sale. And so the U.S. Shipping Board winds up owning this and a number of the other early German ships that we'd seized and used as, as uh, troopers in World War I uh, and what to do with them. So at this point, uh, as everyone's dickering about what, what the U.S. Shipping Board should do, um, we're going to enter another genius man, William Francis Gibbs and his brother Frederick Gibbs. Um, William Francis Gibbs is a self-taught naval architect and marine engineer. Uh, he and his brother grew up in a lot, uh, very extreme wealth in Philadelphia. Their father's a businessman who does a lot of speculation in the gas industry and uh, several other industries. Um, they live a life of privilege. They travel back and forth to Europe on the fastest liners of the day in first class, Mauritania, Lusitania among them. Um, William Francis, as a young child, becomes fascinated with ships. He's drawing ships. He's diagramming ships. He's dreaming about ships ever since he was a young boy. In Philadelphia, you also have the Cramp Shipyard, uh, so they're able to go down there and look at uh, anything that's being built. And based on the fact their father's very wealthy, they have exposure to a number of things that young children don't have exposure to, uh, including connections later in life. Uh, William Francis Gibbs will go to um, Harvard. He will not graduate, um, and then he will go to Columbia for a law degree. But he's not trained as an engineer or a scientist, which makes his story even all the more amazing. But they spend their life, the give lives, the Gibb brothers, drawing and dreaming of, of ships. And by the end of the teens, they've come up with this plan to build the world's first thousand foot long liner that will travel at 30 knots. Uh, it's kind of an older design where you see the straight stem and you see the elliptical stern and you've got that, that paired uh, set of funnels that the Germans pioneered uh, back in the late part of the 19th century. But it's an amazing thing because it's going to be um, uh, powered by electric propulsion, elect electric motors spinning the propellers. And this is a feature that's well ahead of its time. In fact, you won't see anything like that on a commercial liner until the Normandy in the 1930s. And even today's ships, the big cruise ships, have electric azipods. So it's a ship very much ahead of its time, and the Gibbs are at the forefront of it, but it doesn't get built for a variety of reasons. And um, by the time they really enter the scene uh, with their plans, they are accorded a visit to uh, the U.S. Navy, who looks at their plans and studies their hull designs. J.P. Morgan himself is so fascinated um, that he brings them on in the 19-teens to be part of his company to potentially build these uh, ships. But unfortunately, the war gets in the way, and that's never going to happen. But William Francis Gibbs becomes the chief of construction for International Mercantile and Marine. And eventually, uh, when the shipping board decides that they're going to rebuild the ship, um, they look to him to help with the redesign. Now, an interesting thing here is that the Germans refused to give up plans to the ship. There were no plans of Vaterland that came out of Germany, so nobody had any idea what the ship looked like. They wanted a million dollars to hand over the plans, and you know the shipping board couldn't proceed with a rebuild until they knew what the ship looked like um, in all aspects. So they hired William Francis Gibbs and his brother to basically go aboard with 100 to 150 draftsmen uh, and diagram the ship from the inside out. This is a tremendous feat that took about 18 months to do, cost about a quarter of a million dollars in 19 teens money, and in short order they produced a set of plans, an accurate set of plans, um, by tracing every single thing in that ship, measuring every bit of hull, measuring and locating every rivet, measuring every bit of wiring, plumbing, you name it, they went through it and they created a complete set of plans which would enable a shipyard to basically rebuild uh, the vessel by knowing where everything was. Just a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment. The ship, um, the ship is sitting in Hoboken, and there's a lot of back and forth politics about whether or not they're going to rebuild her. And she sits there, and she sits there, and everyone's fighting it out. And in 1921, there's a major pier fire um, on Pier Five, and the, and the Leviathan is at the next pier. She's been sitting there since the end of the war, and. All of a sudden, embers and cinders land on her decks and start lighting or setting lifeboats alight. And uh, fortunately, the Gibbs brothers are in New York. They managed to uh, get onto the ship, 
and directed some firefighting efforts to wet the ship's uh, exterior decks down. She doesn't have a lot of steam up, so this is kind of a challenge, but they were able to do it and prevent her from burning. But her hull is blistered, her upper works are blistered, her, her funnels are blistered, and uh, Gibbs really, at this point, learns a lesson about fire safety. In the bottom picture, he conducts a test uh, after this fire by bringing up steam pressure and hooking up all the fire hoses and uh, basically training the crew that's watching the ship uh, how to fight fire if in case something like this were to arise again. It's very important and it sets his mind at how not to build a ship with wood. And this we'll see later in the United States where the ship is not built with any wood and it's considered extremely fireproof. But fire at sea was a big issue in these days, a big concern. And Gibbs is aware of that, and he wants to protect the ship, obviously, and prohibit any kind of disaster he can. Okay, enter Newport News, Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company. They win the contract for the refurbishing. The the cost to refurbish the ship was going to be tremendous, and indeed there were a number of bids that came in. But Newport News bid low because they had just lost about $70 million in contracts after the war ended, which is decimating the um, labor force in this area in uh, Norfolk, and so Homer Ferguson, the shipyard boss, bids low. He bids low knowing that it's going to cost the shipyard more money than he bids, but he's going to be able to put a lot of people to work uh, and just keep keep this area from going into a grave, depressed state. You have to keep in mind that there are no social safety networks at this time, and so it's very, very important that um, something is done to keep the workers employed. So the ship goes down to Newport News in 1922. She's brought in, and she is refurbished from stem to stern in the finest tradition. William Francis Gibbs is a perfectionist. He's not going to let any stone go unturned. He is going to create a vessel that is second to none on the North Atlantic. He hasn't been able to build his own 1,000-foot liner, but he's going to put all of his talents into reconditioning the Leviathan. She's all torn up and worn from her days as a trooper and everything is open um, so you know it's going to be easy to get at things uh, versus having to tear things out and start anew but the work starts in earnest in 1922 it takes more than a year 12,000 craftsmen come on board uh, rooms that have been ripped out below first class are all rebuilt beautifully uh, all this tiredness all this shabbiness from the war and all the heavy use by the troops is removed and she'll come out as a brand new first class vessel uh, the contract was for $6.2 million. It actually ultimately goes over $8 million and nearly bankrupts the shipyard. Um, but the main point of this is that all of her machinery is reconditioned, including uh, converting her to an oil burning ship, which will not only give her a more efficient propulsion system, but also give her an extended lease on life uh, as the coal burning age is coming to a close. It also is an opportunity not only to employ the craftsmen uh, down at Newport News, but it's also an opportunity to buy supplies for the rebuild from all of the um, states in the nation and provide economic benefits to a lot of other markets as well. And Gibbs creates a little bit of controversy because he winds up remeasuring the ship, and she comes out of the shipyard at 59,956 gross registered tons, more than five a GRT above her uh, Vaterlin Bay gross registered tonnage which is kind of an amazing feat because nothing has been done to substantially alter the ship. But his very careful measurement in the American system versus the British system leads to a higher tonnage and has a lot of uh, uh, heads, heads waving and, and you know bobbing up and down because, quite frankly, the third ship in the sister, Bismarck, is actually physically larger and her gross register tonnage would naturally be bigger than the, the Vaterlands. But no one challenged it because, quite frankly, they figured he was a fool Gross registered tonnage uh, is what you're charged on for port taxes, so they figured, well, it's Gibbs' folly. Let him figure it out. Uh, so Majestic, the sister ship, didn't challenge this uh, when she sailed later for um, the White Star Line, uh, and Gibbs was left to claiming that he had the biggest ship in the world. The ship is quickly put right over the course of a year or so. She's starting to come out of her, her, her funk. Uh, this is an image uh, just after she, before she comes out of Newport News. Gibbs is in a hat in the center with glasses, looking very pleased about the rebuild. When she comes out of Newport News, she's taken up to Boston. It's the biggest dry dock, brand new, uh, in the East Coast. She is slid into the dry dock. And for the first time, they can get at her bottom uh, and paint underneath, clear all the marine growth off, and do some work on the propellers. Um, and she really emerges a brand new ship.
And like a Technicolor dream, she comes alive in a beautiful red, white, and blue livery for her country, the flag of the United States, and uh, still maintains some of her German uh, regalness with the ornate uh, scroll work around the stern. But now we have the seal of the United States uh, versus the old German Imperial Eagle. So it's looking more and more American every day. Again, at Boston in the dry dock, getting ready to go out uh, for her maiden voyage in July 1923. The public of Boston is asked to come down. They're welcome to come on to South Boston where she's in the dry dock to take a look. They get to tour her with proceeds going to Siemens Charity. It's a huge crush of people. A lot of people faint. It's very hot and humid weather in Boston that day. And there's just a mad rush to get aboard for the one-hour tour. But eventually she leaves Boston. She sails here past Castle Island, one of the best ship-watching spots in the world. And she goes down the East Coast off Cuba and Florida to do her trial run. And it's the first of many controversies that will dog her because uh, the newspapers claim that you know Gibbs is spending a million dollars on a junket for all the owners and uh, uh, representatives of the United States line and senators, and et cetera. But the ship needs a trial run. She's rebuilt. It's not the same ship that came out of the shipyard. So no one disagrees with that. But they don't like the fact that the company is paying for all these people to go down. But it's an opportunity for the new crew to get um, familiar with the ship. They have to test everything from light switches to uh, you know, uh, plumbing to how the galleys work. They have to figure out how to serve meals to passengers. Um, it's a tremendous enterprise, and it has to be done. The only way to do it is by going out and doing it, and certainly they do. They head down the coast. Um, everything performs just as Gibbs would, would hope it would have. Uh, he's a master master planner. He's perfectionist to a T. And no stone is left unturned with him. He takes the ship down off of Cuba, turns her around, and races up the East Coast and pushes the ship to her limits. And indeed, for a period of 25 hours, she runs 687 miles, averaging 27.48 knots, which is a huge, huge deal for a ship this big. Remember, her normal service career would have been about 23, 23 and a half knots. But she's now propelled by oil. She's got, new, uh, she's got clean propellers, clean underbody. Um, the entire propulsion plant has been made more efficient through some of the changes they've done to uh, the boilers themselves, to the vacuum system. And she just reaches an incredible 27.48 knots on a 25-hour run coming up the coast. She actually is pushed to 28 knots or over 28 knots for some time. Um, and it's just a tremendous achievement for this new American vessel who comes out uh, proudly waving the red, white, and blue funnels. Uh, and Gibbs and his, his new company, Gibbs and Cox, are just, um, they're just feted in all directions. They are, they are achieving an amazing feat by putting the world's largest liner into service for the United States and a new revised merchant marine, um, which was the goal of the U.S. Sh Shipping Board. Uh, to build up a, a new merchant marine for passenger traffic and also commerce. Seen here in uh, New York prior to her maiden voyage, cutting quite a figure. But the other thing that's happening as she's going into service is that prohibition is the law of the land. It's been in place since 1920. She's coming online in 1923. And needless to say, it's going to be a dry ship. It has to be a dry ship because that's the law. You cannot drink, you cannot transport alcohol, uh, and you cannot make alcohol. So it's going to be very difficult for American ships because there's no way to stock them and provision them. Nonetheless, the publicity machine, the great publicity machine, gets going. Uh, the government spends millions on publicity when they own the ship or while they own the ship. Um, and it's the age of just beautiful lithography, beautiful PR, um, all, all American red, white, and blue ship, gorgeous colors, gorgeous... Uh, PR work for the new ship, and uh, off she goes into service, into a service as the American way to Europe. Very proud. Commodore Herber, Her Herbert Hartley on the bridge, and here she is cutting a fine line coming out of New York Harbor. And she launches, and she's a very happy ship. Uh, the passengers are happy. The crew are happy. Things will settle in in short order. Uh, she'll make three trips under the Gibbs brothers who run her just to make sure everything looks good before they turn her back over to the U.S. Shipping Board, who then will run her for the next several years. But another problem comes up in 1924. It's, it's the end of uh, unfettered immigration to the United States. And so by 1924, the year after she goes into service, the immigration quota for the United States drops to 164,000 immigrants allowed in per year. And so you can see at the end of 1923, 
the annual amount of immigrants that were supposed to or would be allowed in would be 422,000. This drops to 164,000 the next year, which is approximately 13,667 per month. Uh, this is going to crush the business of the immigrant trade on the North Atlantic with all these large hulls like Vaterland or Leviathan, her sisters now serving as Berengaria or Majestic, Olympic, Aquitania, Mauritania. Uh, these are all ships that have been built to carry tremendous amounts of immigrants, and that space is now going to have to be given over to something else. Uh, and it will soon be given over to uh, passengers going to Europe um, for vacation, for tourist class. Uh, the rise of tourist travel is a new thing in the 20s, but it's purposely put in place because it has to re replace the loss of income from immigrants. And indeed, in her first couple of years, the ship is just magnificent. She has everything everything going for her. Her passenger lists are full. She's the in-ship on the North Atlantic. Uh, and she's called the big noise in Southampton. She comes into Southampton quite frequently, every three weeks. She's seen here with her rival, the Olympic from the White Star Line. And she's known as the big noise in Southampton because when her American crews come in on their dry ship, they go out drinking. And they carouse and they make a lot of... Uh, commotion in the port, and uh, it's a rather interesting time. No one can uh, deny when the Americans are in, in town. Here she is seen again, uh, nose to tail with the Olympic, and again in New York, uh, pictured with Olympic. Uh, she's got her own baseball team, which travels all over England and spreads the word of who she is and uh, how uh, glorious this new American ship is. When she's in England or she's in America, uh, at Christmas time, she hosts orphans, uh, you know, basically dinners and, and functions for orphans. Here they all are lined up in the beautiful Ritz-Carlton. Um, and she has her own orchestra. She has the uh, SS Leviathan Orchestra, which go on to record records on the Victor label. Um, they play at music halls and vaudeville houses all over the country, which further generates all sorts of PR for the ship. You have to remember at this time, radio is just coming into its own, um, and so the music hall circuit, the vaudeville circuit, is a big deal. And you have all these musicians dressed in, you know, naval or uh, merchant marine outfits. And so it just ties in the music to the ship. She comes back and forth into Boston frequently for her updates and her, um, her scheduled annual maintenance every December. Uh, she is maintained impeccably. And she is just uh, a million-dollar figure sailing all over the world. She is routinely welcomed into New York by Navy Reserve Flyers. Um, and she's just uh, the toast of the town for the, most of the 20s. Now, the U.S. Shipping Board does have a mandate, and that is to try to put the American Merchant Marine, which they own, it's a government entity, these ships are owned by the government, the mandate is to try to sell the ships to American interests, to private American interests, and this becomes very difficult because you have a ragtag fleet of ships, and uh, the cost to running this enterprise is huge, and certainly after the war, the deep pockets are with the government, and certainly the government has unlimited reserves that they can tap into to run the ship, to promote the ship, and even to lose money on the ship if need be. But in order to create goodwill and American um, goodwill, certainly in the country, by its citizens for a merchant marine, the government is willing to spend that kind of money. So it's a huge layout of cash. Um, but they do try to sell the ships every year. And in 1926, Gibbs and uh, several colleagues tried to bid for the United States line. Um, and they are rebuffed uh, because the, there, are, there, are, there are people in the board and in Congress that don't want to sell the ships. They, they want to keep them at hand. I think there's also uh, a lot of graft going on, too. Uh, the government does have deep pockets, and you know there's, there's a lot of money that goes around to the government and a lot of money that goes into people's pockets. And so when the ships go into private ownership, that little um, nest egg will cease for a lot of people who are uh, political appointees on the shipping board who are in with the president or the commerce secretary or other aspects of the government or Congress who have tremendous oversight into the shipping board operations and appropriations. So uh, the government keeps uh, keeps people at bay and they don't sell the ships. Uh, and it's kind of ridiculous too because these are some German liners that are uh, down in Chesapeake Bay being saved in case they're needed again for war service. But it's the 20s, these ships are 20 years old, and the government's actually insisting that some operators make a move to put these back into commercial service as a running mate to Leviathan. Leviathan is so big and so fast, one of the bigger problems over her career is she doesn't have a suitable running mate. And these ships are not it, but the government's trying to do anything they can. They're carrying them on their books, but rather than having sit off of uh, 
in Chesapeake Bay, wind up putting them back into service. But it's it's a fool's errand because uh, they're just outmoded and outdated in every way possible. A nice image from the 19, uh, 1930 season in Southampton with all the Ballin sisters coming together with Leviathan on the left. Uh, we have the um, Majestic off on the left in the back, the former uh, Bismarck, and then on the right we have Baron Garrier for Cunard Line, which was the first ship in the series, Imperator. And the PR publicity machine continues for United States Line um, handily into the 1920s. Uh, Queen Maria of Romania comes on board. It's royalty on an American ship, which is a very big deal, which is publicized worldwide. Um, she's an amazing figure. She was the people's princess before Diana, and she's revered. She comes on board. She interacts with passengers and the crew, and she's very much beloved. And all of this just, you know, really pumps up the image of the United States lines. 1927, Clarence Chamberlain, the famous uh, aviator, runs a test off an 80-foot ramp that's been erected in front of the first funnel to try to start a, an airmail service to speed the mails off the coast of uh, New York into land uh, to save a few days on uh, airmail, but it's just a crazy scheme and it doesn't last. Another outfit in 1929 will also try this by hooking airbags, airmail bags on the decks. Again, abandoned. It's a fool's errand. But um, just a beautiful space here. This is actually the uh, Imperial, former Imperial Suite where um, Queen Marie will stay aboard, aboard, but a private promenade, very lovely space. But finally, in 1929, the ship is sold to private interests. A businessman by the name of Paul Chapman will buy United States lines, and he'll do several smart things. He will bring up the number of voyages per year to 16. He will eliminate second class and expand the tourist class into a new tourist third class to take on business where um, the immigrant traffic had failed. And he brings booze back on the ship. Um, the Leviathan itself becomes very profitable, but when you spread the costs of all of the obligations he has by owning the entire fleet of U.S. line ships that the government has sold him, uh, there's mortgages on the ships and other indebtedness, um, the line loses money. And over time, it's not going to be uh, sustainable, especially as we get into the Great Depression. But part of the Merchant Marine Act of 1926 and that goes into the Chapman era is government subsidies to build new liners and certainly uh, to build the U.S. Merchant Marine up, we look to build new ships, um, which has not been happening at this point. But the cabin class liners Manhattan and Washington are eventually ordered by the end of the 20s and they're designed and go into service in the early 30s. Uh, by the Chapman era, it still is the United States lines and U.S. way to Europe, a very proud service. But unfortunately, all good things have to come to an end. In 1929, the stock market crashes uh, on Black, uh, Black Thursday. Um, and it's kind of ironic because at this time and in this year, the U.S. Alliance has installed the first stock exchange on a ship, which coincides with the first ship-to-shore telephone service. Um, but again, this comes too little too late. Also in 1929, you see Germany roaring back uh, with its two new Greyhounds, uh, first of which is going to be the Bremen, which starts stealing passenger traffic on the North Atlantic. So you have a number of challenges that are happening. You have new ships that are coming online through the 20s. You have the stock market crash. And this is going to affect all the big liners, not the least of which will be Leviathan. Also in 1929, at the end of the year, uh, Leviathan sails into a, a very bad Atlantic storm and winds up um, hitting a wave so badly that she cracks her hull. 20 feet of hull plating on the starboard side of the ship cracks from the upper deck straight down to sea deck, uh, which provides a tremendous problem for U.S. lines, which has to either decide to repair the ship or take it out of service. The decision is made to repair it, and she does come into a shipyard. And again, this is just as the stock market is crashing. No one knows what the future will look like, certainly. But she's brought back into the shipyard, and it's going to be a major repair and an expensive repair. So the ship is taken out for four to five months while it's it's repaired. This crack is replaced with numerous new plated hull steel plates um, and a tremendous amount of work that goes into it to, to rip out cabins and other interior decor to be able to get at the inside of the hull. Nonetheless, the ship is done. Um, she's totally repaired at an ex exorbitant cost um, and she emerges a brand new ship almost in 1930 with the first Art Deco nightclub on the ocean, um, the Club Leviathan. Seen uh, with a brand new Deco brochure here uh, for the 1930 season. 
And for the first time, uh, travelers are getting a really interesting glimpse of what a funky Art Deco nightclub will look like at sea. It's a beautiful space uh, with linoleum tile floors and orange, orange rugs with black musical motifs, beautiful silk wall coverings, um, just a, a nice warm space. It has uh, multicolored lights that are able to be flashed or glow softly up in this new reflective ceiling. And it's done by building the space into what was the old palm court. It was determined that this was an older feature. Um, the ship is now 14 years old. This is something that Atlantic liners offered at the beginning of the 20th century into the Edwardian age. And certainly uh, this has taken over quickly. The Ritz-Carlton restaurant, which is behind the bandstand, is also brought into a, as part of the club. It will no longer serve as the Ritz-Carlton. And it's a very popular space with travelers. It is the sort of the inn space. It is the deco space, uh, art deco coming in in the middle of the 20th century, the machi machine age with uh, aluminum surfaces, glass surfaces, mirrored surfaces, getting away from that heavy baronial woodwork. Um, the space will have its own orchestra. It will also have a massive picture screen and able to show uh, sound movies for the first time on the Atlantic and uh, come with all sorts of interesting uh, decorative motifs including its own special china, which ties into the decor on the floor with the musical motifs in the rug and in the linoleum. And again, the ship sails on. She comes out in 1930, and certainly the club edition is a, is a welcome addition. Blues is back, so the ship is now starting to pick up steam again. Um, we see a couple of other PR firsts with the first television broadcast at sea, the first radio broadcast at sea. But we're coming into 1930, and we have a big problem. Um, a very quick look will show you, if not to belabor the point about money, but um, when you look at the gross domestic product of the United States between 1929, just before the stock market crash, and right up through the 30s when the ship will be taken out of service, you see that the Depression begins in 1929, and real GDP for the U.S., which is a measure of all the goods and services produced in the country, starts off at $1.1 $1 trillion dollars. And then it continues to sag and sag as the, as the country goes into the 30s. Uh, we have the Dust Bowl, which decimates the American farmland. Um, we have Hoover tax heights, and it just, the, the economy totally sags out of control. And at the same time, you're seeing all this new tonnage come online. We have the Bremen and the Europa, the new uh, German speedsters. We have the new motor vessel Britannic from the White Star Line. Manhattan and Washington, the two new American cabin class liners are coming on board. The beautiful Italian liners Rex and Conte de Savoia, with Normandy coming in in 1935, the new Queen Mary in 1936, and certainly all the older tonnage, Mauritania, Olympic, Berengari, Aquitania, Majestic, France, Paris, Homeric, and the Ile de France. So you have this massive worldwide uh, e economic downturn. You have more hulls coming on than passengers going on the ocean. And in the meantime, in the midst of this, you have uh, a massive repair for Leviathan in 1929-30, and another re renovation in 1932, uh, both of which cost more than $12 million in today's dollars. Uh, and you have no passengers that are traveling because nobody can afford to travel anymore, particularly the, uh, the folks who are traveling in tourist thirst class as a matter of going over uh, on budget holidays. So Chapman winds up going broke in all of this because he's really indebted uh, on some of the mortgages he's assumed under U.S. lines uh, from the shipping board. And a new concern um, based on the American Mercantile Marine uh, Combine buys the ship. And it's really pretty evident early on that they don't want to run the ship. They take the ship out of service and they play games with showing that the ship is basically a money loser. And this is done because they want to retire the ship. There, there is a lot of money after the Merchant Marine Act um, of 1928 to build new hulls. And again, I think part of this is just there's a lot of graft in this industry. Uh, and the folks who wind up buying out uh, United States Lines create another company named United States Lines, which is now owned by International Mercantile and Marine. And um, there are folks who are very close to the president, Kermit Roosevelt, uh, former President Teddy Roosevelt's son, Vincent Astor, and others who are very wealthy businessmen. They're not in this to make an American merchant marine. They're in this somehow to, to line their own pockets. And indeed, part of this is um, a lot of back and forth international tussle with competition in the UK, which is led by International Mercantile and Marine, which is a huge combine, who don't want the Leviathan to sail. They don't want any American competition. 
And so they work very closely with their IMN counterparts through Kermit Roosevelt and Vincent Astor to get the Leviathan out of service. And this is done by running poorly advertised cruises um, and trying to paint a picture in the, in the paper that it's a white elephant. This ship needs to be taken out and the United States Merchant Marine needs to go into another, another realm. But nonetheless, they're still sailing into 1932 and they push the Leviathan to go back to Germany, which she hasn't been to in 18 years. The problem with that is you've got the Bremen and the Europa running out of Germany and they're pulling all the passenger traffic. So the, the Leviathan sails with very low passenger lists out of Bremerhaven back to Southampton and the, the passages are not well booked. And again, it's more fodder to say that she's not, not producing and not pulling her own weight economically. Uh, she's going to be laid up in 1933 because it's just it's costing them more money supposedly to run her than she's worth, um, and it's just uh, it's a sad time for the ship because you want to develop the American Merchant Marine. She's this is cherry ship, the biggest ship that we have, which is really actually not in bad shape. It's just been given a major overhaul after the big crack of 2930, and uh, it's just being let to languish for political reasons, and so. There's a public outcry. William, France, uh, William Randolph Hearst rather, is still not happy with the fact that the British IMM Corporation owns a ship, but his entreaties don't go as far as they would have back in the 20s when he was uh, really adamant about spreading word about the ship going to IMM at that time. So the ship languishes, but the American public gets onto this and um, makes a big stink about it. A lot of Senate senators and other folks come out and start swinging at IMM and say, you're not living up to your obligations. And the obligations under the contract with the um, U.S. Shipping Board were that the, the operator was going to run seven cruises per year. And this was not happening. The ship was laid up. So after a lot of outcry, it was decided that the ship would return to service in 1934. So the ship is brought out back to the shipyard, gets a full painting, full refurbishment, and she's run for but five cruises in 1934. They're poorly advertised. They're not well attended or, or up to capacity by any standard. And by the last cruise, when she comes back from Europe, she has 187 passengers aboard to a crew of more than 700. So economically, that's a disaster. The folks at IMM decide, well, it's cheaper to pay the penalty not to run her on the final two cruises out of the seven. They pay $10,000 for uh, aborted voyages, six and seven, and she goes back to Hoboken and she languishes and she languishes. And she languishes. By 1935, the Normandy, the Speed Queen from France, is online, and the Leviathan is sitting in Hoboken, where she is going to rot at the pier. She's left to rot, basically, and left to fall off to the weather and the elements. Photos taken at the end by the famous American photographer Margaret Pork White show how her upper decks have been just let let go. All the wood is not being varnished, it's not being treated, uh, portholes are open. Uh, it's just a, a rot fest in every direction. The funnels actually look good and those are being painted, believe it or not, every number of months because the funnels are rusting and the fear is if they don't paint the funnels to protect them, they will collapse, they will fail. There is a fire watch aboard the ship. It is uh, definitely manned and uh, you know it's not abandoned. But things are just deteriorating to the point of no return. And this is very purposeful on the part of IMM um, to just let it go so that they can get the government to agree to let them sell the ship. A quick look at costs overall, and these are all in $2020, but from contemporary sources converted to $2020, the ship has cost the U.S. government or private entities more than $537 million since her Navy rebuild in 1917. A staggering amount of money. Um, where the U.S. Shipping Board in 1923 had estimated to build a new ship like Leviathan would cost about $375 million. Again, these are all in 2020 dollars for comparison. So you can see that the cost to refurbish and maintain the ship over time, not including even uh, the total of um, expense to run her as a Navy boat, far exceeds what the estimated cost would be to replace her in 1923. So a lot of money has been expended. There are sources that say that up to about $900 million have been expended uh, in 2020 dollars, of course, uh, to keep the ship afloat since the U.S. seized her in 19, uh, 1916, 17. But the real truth is in, the, is in the numbers. And if you look at three distinct points in her service career, 
the numbers do tell a story. In 1925, she's one of the top five liners on the ocean. She is uh, right at the top three with her other Ballin uh, shipmates, the four, the, the three big German queens, um, and she's carrying per crossing more than a thousand passengers, average for the year. Uh, by 1929, she's still in the top five, carrying about 1,135 passengers per crossing, doing very, very well. And this is the Chapman era, and all, all instances and all sites are looking up. But by 1934, there's a glut of tonnage on the ocean. And in fact, no one's traveling. This is the era of the Great Depression. And if you look at the passenger numbers in 1934, all the big ships are suffering. Leviathan, the new Bremen, the new Manhattan, the new Washington, they're all trending badly. These are huge liners meant for thousands of passengers. Uh, certainly the early liners are meant for more than 5,000 passengers. And you can see that the traffic is just dismal. And these, these numbers are not economically sustainable. So unfortunately, all the old tonnage is going to ultimately be released, Leviathan herself included. But she's uh, been maintained very well through the years. I mean, she has great crossing speeds. In fact, these are average speeds, obviously. And so there are trips where she's had plenty of power and reserve that she's had to make up time. And she'll routinely cross for her early career in about five days, 12, 13 hours. She makes up time after storms, of course. So there are many crossings where her average speed is in excess of 24 knots. But overall, these are the numbers. Um, and so she's done very, very well. By no means, as many would suggest, was she a loser in the number of passengers she carried, uh, in her technology. She was very much a product of her time. She was maintained, and she was very proudly maintained by her American crews. But by 1937, the writing is on the wall. She is sold to a British scrapper, and in 1938, she will depart for Scotland, where she'll be broken up. Um, and that will be the end of her story, more or less. Her funnels are cut down, her masts are cut down to enable her to get under the bridge at the Firth of Forth. And she will go over in January of 1938 in bitter cold. Um, her bow and fleet mate, the old Bismarck, which had been operating for White Star Line as Majestic, had been taken out of commercial service just prior to her taken out. Um, and so the Admiralty in Britain actually rescued, gave a little reprieve to the Majestic by turning her, her into a training ship, uh, the HMS Caledonia. And she is actually in the dock in Rosseth, Scotland, where ships are being broken up. And she'll be there uh, beautifully appointed. I mean, her funnels are all so low and her masts were cut down to be able to transit the same bridge. But she's been repainted and she's in the dock as a training ship. And she looks quite a figure as Leviathan comes in. And indeed, um, Leviathan will come over in January of 1938, um, belching smoke, nobody really cares, you don't have to have your boilers tuned to any kind of efficiency, and there'll be some minimal crowds, it's a cold February when she comes in, uh, this is the the railroad bridge over the Firth of Forth, um, just outside of Edinburgh, and the ship will approach with her trimmed masts and her trimmed funnels, and she'll easily transit the bridge, there's no question, she'll obviously make it, o make it under the bridge. But the interesting thing when you look at this, despite all her, her wear and tear and sitting at the pier in Hoboken for so many years, when she does approach the camera, you'll see that the hull itself actually looks like it's in pretty good shape. Uh, there's not a lot of rust going on. Um, clearly, a ship that could have easily been maintained, um, but, you know, the writing was on the wall, and here the ship even seems to fight the mooring lines that are trying to propel her towards tying up for the last time at the pier. Almost done almost rung with engines, final final finish with engines, and her career will be over at this point um, when she shuts down all her boilers and, and goes cold. But it's not quite over. There is a ship auction, as with all ships being broken, they are uh, basically auctioned off their interiors, their furniture, their fittings to make money. And she has a massive auction, one of the largest auctions to date. She has 407, uh, sorry, 4,700 lots or more up for sale, 250-page auction manual. In over eight days, the auction will raise $1.2 million. And you can see everything is splayed out in the public room for display, and everything's marked up. Um, and there's some great deals to be had on furniture and fittings, wood walls, beautiful carpets, artwork, linoleum, navigational equipment, all taken off, china, silverware. And then she's broken. 
uh, starting in the month of April in 1938. The Breaker's Torch comes out and she is scrapped and recycled for future use. She still cuts a beautiful figure, her 950 foot long hull sitting there with that superstructure all gone, but eventually she is reduced to scrap. The scrapping process will actually take until 1940 because the dock has to be put into use for war, uh, war use. Uh, so part whatever's left of her uh, prior to 1940 is towed out. But again, they'll finish the job in 1940, and that will be all that that they said for the Leviathan. Her career is over, but she's still in in the popular memory, and she still was at that time too a very, very well loved beloved ship for her war service and her flag waving, waving capabilities as a U.S. liner. A side note, a little side note about Albert Ballin, her designer who was reasonably close to the Kaiser. When the Kaiser abdicated the throne at the end of World War I, uh, Albert Ballin was very distraught because he was about to see his dream decimated, a dream of a commercially successful Euro, uh, Germany, rather, um, one that stood uh, with all the other nations of the world in peace. This is all crushed. All of his ships that he designed, the big three particularly, are taken over and given uh, as reparations to other countries. And this just tortures poor Albert Ballin, and he does take his own life uh, two days before the armistice is signed in 1918. Uh, Hamburg, America will remember him later by building a ship named Albert Ballin. Germany will release his stamp for the centenary of his birth. And recently, Hopog Lloyd, which is the combination of the old Hamburg, America and North German Lloyd, which is now a big shipping container company, have devised the Albert Ballin Award for Global Action, awarded to individuals or institutions that assume social, cultural, or political responsibility through their actions um, to honor global initiatives that foster networking among peoples and, cu peoples and cultures um, and advocate on behalf of the victims of globalization. It's a fitting tribute to someone who was very much into the common man, uh, came up from nothing, was a Jew in very anti-Semitic Germany and did very well as a man who came from nothing and rose to be a man of culture, class, and some means. And that's it. That's how you should see the Leviathan, uh, as she would have sailed off into the sunset as a working liner. And uh, she's very much remembered and revered today, and we hope to keep her memory alive uh, for years to come through um, the discovery and the sharing of many uh, artifacts, uh, some of the beautiful digital colorizations that go on uh, to the black and white photographs to bring the to bring the color in to bring the history alive. Just a quick note about resources. Um, there are a number of books that are available. Um, first of all is the epic six volume set by Frank Brainerd, Leviathan, the world's greatest ship. It is six volumes, 2,000 pages, about 20 pounds. Um, it's a great resource and uh, if you can get a copy of the set it's it's well worth your time. Uh, Vachelon, The Leviathan by Les Streeter of the UK is a great book, lots of pictures. Same with SS Leviathan, American's First Superliner by Brent Holt. And then um, the contemporary autobiography of Commodore Herbert Hartley, the ship's first captain, as well as the history of the USS Leviathan, which is a book that was written by a ship's history committee that was aboard the ship in World War I. A fascinating look at um, the ship from the perspective of being a warship with just tremendous amount of detail at that time from that time home as a sailor and the history of the USS Leviathan are both available online free uh, you can find them at archive.org uh, a more modern book called the great rescue um, about the ship's service in World War one it's a good read it's pretty accurate um, it's worth worth a look uh, two books on the amazing William Francis Gibbs including By Their Works Ye Shall Know Them, which was published by Gibbs and Cox in a limited run of 2000 when their founder passed away in 1967. And finally, a modern resource um, is a Facebook page that I run. Uh, it's called SS Leviathan. If you Google it on Facebook, you'll find it. It's a private group, which only means you have to request permission to join, and that's just to keep spammers out. It's a great uh, resource. Lots of um, interesting stuff comes out from folks all over the world. And uh, we would love to see you there if you'd like to join us. And finally, to close it all off, and a personal thank you from me, uh, it is a little, uh, little help from our friend the Old Salt uh, from the Leviathan and the Vachelon's first-class smoking room, which is part of my collection. And I know he's very pleased 
uh, of your interest in his great ship. Again, thank you, and I look forward to seeing you uh, at some event soon and to talk to you about Leviathan.